All right, so I haven't been as active on social media lately, but still, I noticed a lot of people going full doomer mode over the weekend in response to a new poll conducted by the New York Times and Siena College, which found Trump ahead nationally for the first time in weeks by one percentage point. And to make matters worse, Nate Silver's model now gives Trump a 64% chance of winning the Electoral College, and betting markets have even shifted in his favor as a result. So upon seeing all of this, I too went a little bit doomer admittedly because I expected the polls to tighten for sure, but I was not expecting Trump to straight up take the lead so quickly. And the New York Times and Siena, they're one of the best pollsters, so if their poll puts Trump ahead, even if it's just by a little bit, I am inclined to think that it's the start of a new trend possibly. But I took a look at aggregate polling data and looked at some individual polls. And I've got to say, it's not that bad yet. And I think that people need to calm down. So let's break it down. If you look at real clear politics polling averages, Kamala is still ahead by 1.3 points overall. But two new polls from Harvard Harris and the New York Times brought her averages down a little bit. Now, the Harvard Harris poll looks worse than it is actually because they had Trump at plus four in their last poll. So even though they're tied, Kamala still gained ground in this poll. Now, also, you can just ignore Rasmussen because they always tend to overstate the lead that Republicans have. Although I will say plus one for a Republican is actually good for Democrats by their standards. But the point is that she's ahead overall. But if you zoom out and look at swing states, it's still very close. Trump has gained ground in Arizona and leads by 1.6 points in Nevada. Harris is narrowly leading. In Wisconsin, Harris has gained ground and is ahead by 1.5 points. In Michigan, Harris is ahead by 1.2 points, but Trump is slowly but surely gaining ground here again. In Pennsylvania, they are dead even. I mean, this is really something to behold. Now, when it comes to North Carolina, Trump's ahead by less than a point, but Harris has gained a considerable amount of ground. And in Georgia, they're basically dead even here as well, although Harris narrowly did take the lead for the first time by a tenth of a percentage point. Now, when it comes to 538's poll aggregator, Harris is up by 2.8 points on average. She was up by 3.3 points nine days ago, so that is a 0.5% change. Now, Nate Silver's polling aggregate also has her ahead, albeit by a little bit less. She's at 2.5 points. Now, I want to pause for a moment because we just looked at a lot, so I want to let us digest this information. So, since the last time that I did a video talking about polls, Things haven't changed that much overall. Kamala Harris erased Trump's lead in swing states the last time we looked at that. And that's essentially still the case, more or less. She's still narrowly leading nationally, and it's very close in swing states still. So this isn't really that surprising because you're never really going to see the line go straight up for any candidate, right? It's going to go up and then down a little, then up and down. You can't really worry about every little change. You have to step back and look at the overall trend. And at this point in time, it does seem like Kamala Harris's national surge is over and she's starting to even out, not go down. Now, that's not to say that there aren't warning signs. I, I think that the fact that they're tied in Pennsylvania when she was kind of eking ahead a couple of weeks ago is alarming, but it's not catastrophic. And the reason why I'm not freaking out yet is because the race is still very close. And we always expected it to be close and it hasn't changed that drastically. But the thing that gives me hope is that there's still room for growth with Kamala Harris, whereas that's not as much of the case with Donald Trump because we kind of know what his ceiling is, whereas we don't know where Kamala Harris's ceiling is. But let's look at some specific polls now. So in the same New York Times Siena poll where Trump was leading by one, Kamala is leading in three out of four swing states, and they are dead even in four. But I mean, they're basically statistically tied in all of them, and this hasn't really changed since the last time that we looked at polls. Now, a poll from CBS News and YouGov basically produced the same result. They are dead even in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Now, here's where things get interesting. As Texas Blue points out, 270 to win has moved Texas and Florida to toss-up states. And if that sounds like too much opium, it probably is. But there's good reason to be optimistic. An A-rated pollster has Harris and Trump tied in Texas, and their last poll had Trump up by two. Now, to be clear, I'm skeptical that Texas and Florida are actually in play, but the fact that Harris is gaining ground in some polls in these deep red states leads me to believe that a more gettable red state like North Carolina might actually be in play. In fact, that's what the polls show. 
which is really encouraging because if Harris were to pick up North Carolina's 16 electoral votes, then she can afford to lose another state like Georgia, right? Which also has 16 electoral votes. So winning North Carolina would give her a little bit of a cushion. And yes, the must win states for her are very close, but the sheer number of states that have been moved to toss ups has increased. So even though they're neck and neck, she has expanded the map, whereas Trump expanded his map for pickups or potential pickups, I should say, when Biden was still in the race. So I say all this to say there's a lot of potential for pickups for Harris. And unlike Donald Trump, it doesn't seem like she's hit a ceiling yet. So there's room for growth, which is very promising. But however you slice it, this is going to be a really close race either way. And it's always been this way, as explained by CNN's Harry Enten. And just point out how close this race has been consistently, consistently close. All right, campaigns where any candidate led by at least five points in the polls. Look, most of the time, there's at least some stretch where one of the candidates is ahead by at least five points. At least three weeks in which one candidate led by at least five points. That happened in every single campaign from 1964 to 2020. How many days? Have we had this campaign where one candidate was ahead by at least five points nationally? Look at this, zero, zero days, zero days. The fact is this race has been consistently tight in a way that we have never seen before, Mr. Bremen. This is always versus never. Correct. That's the difference between this campaign and every other campaign we've it. seen for the last 75 years or so. All right, the battleground polls that we're looking at. Give us some perspective on how close they are. Uh, you know, sometimes we look at these seven close states and, you know, you see all these numbers that are up there and you go, I can't make heads or tails of it. So I just want to sort of combine them and look at the Democrat versus Donald Trump and those seven closest battleground states. Look at the 2020 final margin and average across these seven states. It was Biden plus 0.9 points. You don't think that could get any closer? We can, in fact, get closer. Look right now, Kamala Harris up, but get this, by just 0.6 points on average only about half a point six tenths of a point my goodness gracious that is how tight we are talking right now across these seven battleground states it is a race mr berman that is well within the margin of error when you look across these seven key battleground states that will determine this election now you look at this you go oh, 0.3 percent then you know then they're basically the same but you're talking about actual vote margins that were so small so show us the difference that a polling margin can make. All right, so let's just say the polls match up perfectly to what the results end up being. Kamala Harris would win this election with 292 electoral votes to Donald Trump's 246. But let's just say we move the current polls and let's say the result differs by them by a single percentage point and Donald Trump is the beneficiary of it. Look at this. If Trump outperforms his current polls by just a single point, you take that Kamala Harris win and look at this. Donald Trump gets 287 electoral votes because the bottom line is Pennsylvania would flip up here and you would also get this flip out in Nevada over here. And that, my friends, is what we're talking about. We are talking about the closest campaign in a generation where a single point could make all the difference in the world. John, this is a truly exciting race right now where any slight movement can make all the difference in the world. It is astonishing how close this race is. And as worrying as that is, let me put things into perspective for you. We were looking at the prospect of a Trump landslide before Biden dropped out. So the fact that we actually have a chance with Kamala is very important, right? Don't take that for granted. Don't freak out yet. Having said that, though, one conclusion that we can definitely draw from the recent polls is that Kamala Harris's honeymoon is definitely over. You know, it was bound to happen at some point, but I actually think that there are things that she did and didn't do that accelerated the end of this honeymoon and possibly even blunted her momentum. First of all, I think that she's harmed herself by having no massive policy announcement. She's announced policy, to be clear, but she doesn't have a signature policy issue that she's really running on. Juxtapose that with Donald Trump, and he's not very policy focused, but you can pinpoint at least one policy, mass deportations. It's an evil policy, but nonetheless, it is something that he is running on. But what is Kamala Harris running on? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's mostly good, but I think that it would behoove her to articulate a clear policy agenda on a couple of issues that makes it clear she's the change candidate in this cycle because that's what voters want. The problem is that I think she's now playing it a little bit too safe and she 
couldn't really give us any specifics about her day one agenda in her interview with Dana Bash. So I think that she needs to change that. That is what I think is holding her back. Now, she also just released her policy platform. And I've got to say, it is underwhelming to put it charitably. Her plan for health care is virtually non-existent, aside from expanding the Affordable Care Act and negotiating more prescription drug prices. I mean, even Biden supported a public option, but she's not even proposing that. Her section on civil rights is depressingly vague. And while she does support the Equality Act, she doesn't even mention trans people outside of the LGBTQ acronym. And she's not saying anything about the nationwide crackdown on trans rights in red states, which is very scary. Not to mention, her platform is also very hawkish on the border. She's still predictably trotting out the same shitty lines about Israel and Gaza, and there's no student debt cancellation or even marijuana legalization. And it is not the kind of proposals that you would expect from a change candidate in a change election. She's basically running as Biden 2.0, which is not a good strategy. Now, after running to the right to court Republicans on fracking and immigration and Israel, she needs to stop doing that. And she needs a big signature policy proposal. And she needs one fast because she's got to excite her base to propel her further in the polls. When young people and leftists were optimistic after she just announced, you know, their enthusiasm was contagious. But as Lindsay Belant put it, interesting that Kamala was way ahead in enthusiasm, which was propelling good poll numbers, when well, the assumption was that she'd be better on Biden on a number of issues. And now that she's made it clear she won't be better than Biden on said issues, her numbers are slumping again. And I do agree with this. Kamala was expected to get a bump after the DNC, but she really didn't. It actually kind of took the wind out of her sails after a Palestinian American wasn't able to speak and also because in her acceptance speech, she sounded like a neocon on foreign policy, which demoralized a lot of leftists and young people who were hoping that she'd be an Obama-esque change figure. Now, even though Obama wasn't the transformative figure that we wanted him to be, that he ran on, he did code himself that way. And I rewatched his 2008 acceptance speech at the DNC after watching Harris's. And even though the same themes were present, you know, paid family leave, same policies, he did not sound as hawkish as Harris. So in my opinion, she needs to stop trying to overtly court Republican leaning swing voters. She needs to recalibrate and determine what she can do to excite her base again, because the initial enthusiasm has faded and she needs to find a way to reignite that spark. That is what I think has kind of blunted her momentum. But I think that her campaign is hesitant to go big because they're afraid that they'll be attacked by Republicans. She needs to stop worrying about that. She needs to go big and her campaign should not be concerned about seeming too progressive because what she needs right now is something that's going to excite the base, a big policy. She could even choose from something that's in her campaign platform right now. Just run on that and make it your signature issue because you need one thing that people can look to and say, hey, this is what Kamala Harris is going to give us. And right now we just don't have that. Again, there's a couple of policies here and there that sound really good, but she needs to be known for something, right? Bernie was the Medicare for all guy. Trump is the wall guy, right? She needs something more. So I think that a lot of people will hear this and say, well, Mike, that's kind of stupid. It's heresy in conventional wisdom because everybody already thinks that she's too liberal. So certainly she needs to be conservative, right? No, stop going with this old ass antiquated way of thinking being progressive is good politics even if voters don't necessarily like somebody who uh, is coded as too liberal or who is supposedly too liberal if you propose a policy that they like regardless if they're conservative or liberal or apolitical the policy is going to be what they care about so if you look at progressive polling data or i should say data on progressive policies most Americans in both parties agree with a lot of progressive things. So it's the label that really hurts them. So if she, for example, proposed Medicare for all, but coded it in a conservative way and said, hey, this is a small business tax cut because businesses are no longer going to have to pay for the health insurance of their employees. It'll be a boom. That would be something that I think would appeal to a lot of small business owners, conservative people potentially, because we all know that healthcare is expensive and we hate dealing with our insurance companies. So if she were to go that bold, not only would she potentially win over the conservatives that she's trying to court right now, not all of them, not a lot of them, but some of them, but she would excite the base. That right there is what she needs. Now, another potential issue is that her campaign's media strategy 
is just really bad. Alex Shepard argues in The New Republic that her decision to seemingly avoid the press is inviting negative criticism, which is a bad sign because it suggests, quote, the people running the Biden campaign still have influence in the Harris campaign. They shouldn't. They ran the most inept re-election campaign in recent memory, one that was racing toward a Trump landslide. None of these people have any business going anywhere near an election that's this consequential. Instead, they're using the same silly ideas. The Times is out to get Harris to guide their decisions, embracing sycophants, TikTokers, and YouTubers, while hiding their intelligent candidate from intelligent reporters at major outlets that are followed by millions of intelligent voters. And I agree with this. And part of the reason why there's an advantage in having a young, more energetic candidate like Harris as opposed to Biden is that you can put them in situations where they're combative, where they can passionately make the case without having to worry about them shitting the bed. The fact that the campaign hasn't deviated from the same strategy they had when they were running an 81-year-old in cognitive decline is insane to me. And it doesn't scream confidence, which I think is hurting Harris. They should be confident. Harris is very charismatic, and she does very well in combative situations. So put her in those situations. Let her spread her wings. And to be clear, I don't necessarily care about the lack of interviews personally, but the press is very thirsty, and they're turning this into a big scandal when it doesn't need to be a scandal. So she should just do a shit ton of inter interviews, cancel out that attack, and make it so that way any one interview isn't overly significant. That's what she needs to do, but it seems like the campaign doesn't want to do that. It seems like they're trying to minimize interviews and just keep her doing these scripted campaign events, which is fine, but if the media is going to turn it into an issue, I think that it's incumbent on the campaign to undercut that critique, right? Now, there's one more theory about why maybe she has stopped surging, and this one is from Nate Silver, and he is blaming Tim Walls. As The Hill reports, he thinks that if she picked Josh Shapiro, she'd be in a better position in Pennsylvania. And to that I say, no, because after she chose Tim Walls, she continued to surge across the country, including in states like Pennsylvania. So to blame him now after the surge is over is nonsensical to me. So while I appreciate Nate Silver's analysis when it comes to raw numbers and data, I've got to say his political analyses are complete dog shit. Tim Walls was a bold choice that excited the base. She needs to do more things like that to excite the base again. But overall, I don't want to give you the impression that it's all doom and gloom because these are just some reasons why I think the surge has stopped. But still, we're in a better position than we were two months ago, and Kamala's numbers aren't necessarily going down. They've just stalled, which indicates that the surge is over. We didn't expect it to go on all the way until the election, so, you know, maybe she didn't get as big of a DNC bump as she had hoped for, but there are things that she can do to change that. Now, if she took my advice and she did some of the things that I recommended— I genuinely believe that she would get another bump and she could ride that way for another couple of weeks. And if she starts going down again, propose a different policy. Run on that too. She doesn't understand how popular it would be to run on marijuana legalization or even a public option at this point, right? People want substantial change. They want a change candidate. So I think that if she embraced that moniker and said, I'm the change candidate, it would do wonders for her. But Again, this is just a snapshot in time, and things can change after the debate. She could surge more. Trump could surge, although that's doubtful because, again, we kind of know already what his ceiling is. But I think that if she campaigns in a certain way, she can improve her numbers, which is good. Either way, I do think it's too soon to panic. I think people are really reading too much into this New York Times poll. And they're too doom and gloom. If it's the start of a trend, we'll see. But as for right now, one poll should not freak you out this much, even though I do understand why people are concerned because there's so much at stake here. But I will say when things start to look really bad, I'll be the first one to let you know. But if I'm not freaking out, you shouldn't be freaking out either because I treat me as your canary in a cold mine, right? Where when I start to panic, that's when you should start to panic. Now I am somebody who panics about everything. So if I'm still okay, you should be okay too. So it's not all doom and gloom yet. It's one bad poll. Let's wait a couple of weeks and reassess, and then I'll let you know where she's at with regard to Trump nationally and in the swing states. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? 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 <laughs> tree? They not like us. Tree? Oh, wow. Tree?
<laughs> you think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs>